think we'll be starting in one minute, right? There's one minute to go. So we'll st still wait for some more people to join us and then it will start officially. Well, it's um, five o'clock our time, so good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, depending on the time zone. Um, on behalf of my co-convener, Professor Anna Evert, and my own, I would like to welcome you all to this second lecture in the um, invited lecture series in bilingualism and multilingualism. The series is organized jointly by the Institute for Advanced Studies in Social Studies and Humanities, the Faculty of English at Adam Mickiewicz University and the Poznań branch of Bilingualism Matters. Uh, today with my colleague, we have convened a series of open lectures by outstanding researchers, distinguished scholars and world experts in the field of bilingualism and multilingualism. And today it is our great honor and privilege to welcome Professor Judith Kroll from the University of California, Erwin, who will, be who will deliver the second lecture in this series on two sides of bilingualism, a lens to the cognitive neuroscience of language and a reflection of our social world. So I would like to ask now Professor Anna Weber to present our distinguished speaker. <clears throat> Judith Kroll is a distinguished professor at the University of California at Irvine <clears throat> and former director of the Center for Language Science at Pennsylvania State University. Her research concerns the way that bilinguals struggle to languages in one mind and brain. Her work, uh, supported by numerous grants from the NSF, the National Science Foundation, and the National Institutes of Health, shows that bilingualism provides a unique tool for revealing the interplay between language and cognition. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, as well as numerous psychological societies, um, such as the American Psychological Association, the Association for Psychological Science, the Psychonomic Society, and the Society for Experimental Psychologists. She was one of the founding editors of the journal Bilingualism, Language and Cognition, published by Cambridge University Press, and one of the founding organizers of Women in Cognitive Science, a group developed to promote the advancement of women in the cognitive sciences. With Penn State colleagues, she was the PI, the principal investigator and collaborator on two NSF partnerships for international research and education grants to develop an international research network and program of training to enable language scientists at all level to pursue research on bilingualism as well as to translate the cognitive and brain science of bilingualism to language learning environments. So this is the introduction. Uh, Professor Crow, it's over to you. I'm gonna share my screen. Many, many thanks for inviting me to give this talk today. I'm very excited to be here and look forward to all of you who are students in the audience and who will meet with me later today uh, to having discussion with you. I'm gonna ask that you hold questions of interpretation to later discussion, um, but feel free to interrupt me uh, if there are questions of clarification. Um, 
Okay, and just a very quick acknowledgement. I have many, many people to whom I am very grateful and indebted for being able to carry out this research over a very long period of time and working within an amazing collaborative community. Uh, as, as Anna mentioned that we have had the support from the National Science Foundation for uh, developing an international network for research on bilingualism. This is amazing opportunities for collaborative research uh, really across the world. So as uh, all of you know, more people in the world are bilingual than not. Um, but until recently, most research on language and cognition focused on monolingual speakers and bilinguals were considered to be special and I have special in quotes. Um, what is special about bilingualism? I'm going to try to touch on three different perspectives today. One coming from the linguistic psycholinguistic uh, world, a second coming from thinking more broadly about the social, cultural, political context for bilingualism, and the third concerning the cognitive and neural basis of the mechanisms. That's so past typical speakers, the uh, simple, pure speakers of a uh, language and that bilingualism would then uh, simply complicate or add to that. Uh, on this view, bilinguals have been considered special because uh, much like other populations, like brain damaged patients, individuals who speak a dialect other than the mainstream or community language, uh, children who have language disorders, deaf individuals who use a sign language, Which all of this research is rich and important for a language. And so each of these groups has been of interest, um, but they've been viewed in some ways as a complication at best, and I'm going to argue efficient at work. And so there's been a very much a deficit model uh, we have had to counter in this research. Of the age at which an individual acquires a language beyond their uh, native or home language, that what we see is we see data like those shown on this slide. So the data on the left are uh, very well known data from Jim Flakey's group on accentedness. The data on the right are very well known data from Johnson and Newport on grammaticality judgments. And what we have on the x-axis in each case is the age at which individuals were exposed, in this case, to English. And what we have on the y-axis in the on the left graph, in the Blakey data, we have how accented their speech is perceived to be. And what we see is that the older a person was at the time that they arrived in this case in Canada in this study, um, the more accented their speech was perceived to be in English. What we see on the right is we see something very similar for judgments of grammaticality, that individuals who arrive past early childhood often make errors in judging whether or not a sentence in English is grammatical or not. And so this view is that we have, there's a constraint that if you acquire a second or third or fourth language after early childhood, that you are not doing that in the same way that individuals acquire their first language. And that the second language is essentially um, supported by domain general cognitive processes, but linguistically constrained. And that's been the sort of traditional classic story. And so my picture here, which is just a little spoof on um, thinking about uh, this, this uh, stereotype or claim that's been made is that you have a speaker who's speaking the L2, but in a very messy brain, whereas you have the person speaking their L1, which is very neat and simple and straightforward. So this 
perspective, um, which I'm going to claim is has been until recently a traditional perspective, is that late bilinguals are indeed special with this mixed language system that includes a perfectly beautiful native language that is stable over life. Uh, and what I'm going to call in a very non-technical way, a funky L2, something that's really a bit messy. Um, on this view, you would expect that bilinguals should be functionally monolingual in their native language. And we should also expect that the native language is going to transfer to the second language in learning. And in fact, we have a very long tradition of um, studies that show that that's indeed the case. Um, but you would not expect much transfer in the other direction. You wouldn't expect that the second language would come to affect the first language because the first language is hypothesized to be stable. Now, switching for a moment from the linguistic perspective to the outside world and the political world and from a US perspective, um, I wanna talk for just a moment and, and point out that this idea that bilingualism may be special or problematic is not just a psycholinguistic problem. Um, these are data from a report that was published in 2017 by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences on really the state of language learning in the, in the US in the 21st century. And what you have here is a chart that shows the percentage of individuals in the US, age five and older, um, who speak English only, and the percentage of individuals who speak a language at home other than English. And what you can see is that almost 80% of the US speaks English only. So monolingualism is overwhelmingly the norm. And in a study that um, Serena and Luck uh, performed in 2019, they tried to investigate just how deeply this English only, English as a norm uh, was really ingrained in uh, individuals in the US. This is a picture of the US, a map of the US. And what you see is this very blue country. And that blue um, is not political <laughs> from the perspective of Democrat and Republican, very sadly, but that blue is uh, indication of how much of the country is really functionally English only. If you look at the scale, you see that that blue means zero to 9% non-English at home. So the blue means these are, these are places where individuals in the US essentially are monolingually English speakers. And what you see is around the rim of the country, you see a more colorful situation, a more linguistically diverse situation, and one where uh, you have a much higher percentage of uh, a non-English language at home. And those uh, fuchsia and green uh, marks in the middle of the map are places where they surveyed people and they said, how socially valuable do you think bilingualism is? And of course, what they found is that people who lived in places that was were bilingual, thought that bilingualism was very important. People who lived in places that were functionally monolingual did not think bilingualism was important at all. Now, what we know from a research perspective is that in the last, and this is really more than a decade ago, on the 125th anniversary of the journal Science, um, the biological basis of second language learning was identified as one of the top 125 questions to be answered in the next 25 years of science in all of science. Um, we're, we're now getting close to that uh, point. I'm not quite sure we will have uh, solved the problem perfectly, but what we have seen is a tremendous upsurge of research on bilingualism and a tremendous upsurge of research on the neurological, biological basis of uh, bilingualism, what's happening in bilingual brains. This is just a bit of data from Web of Science showing this explosion of research on bilingualism in this period between 1993 and 2012. And if we were to continue for the next nine years, we'd see even a, even a greater uh, increase. So the point is that the language and learning sciences have come to see that bilingualism is of interest in its own right. And it's interesting in terms of thinking about and understanding the politics of where we live. 
but there's also a new attitude to see that bilingualism is a lens. It's a tool for revealing the workings of language, the mind, and the brain. Now, this lens has only very recently opened to the social world. It has been focused for quite a long time on the issue of what happens in the mind, what happens in the brain, how is learning affected by language? Um, but very recently, and of course, those of you who are sociolinguists have been focused on this question for a very long time, but it's only very recent that psycholinguistics cognitive neuroscience has begun to take seriously the idea that we are social humans and we live in a context where we need to understand how the social context, how the environment interacts with uh, cognition and, and uh, brain processing. So what have we learned in this period of time? We've learned that being bilingual changes the architecture of your brain. And uh, we also have a lot of press. If we go back out to the real world for just a moment, there is a lot of press and all of you are familiar with this. Press about bilingualism being good for your brain uh, and bilingualism creating uh, creating benefits for the brain. And, and you had uh, Ellen Bialystok was the first uh, speaker in this lecture series. So you've heard quite a lot about the basis of, uh, of these claims and of this uh, research. Um, however, there's also been quite a lot of uh, what I would call controversy rather than debate. Uh, the controversy in the sense that there are people who think that all of these uh, consequences of bilingualism are really overstated. And if you think for a moment and you stop for a moment and think of that blue map in the United States that I showed you, um, you might say, well, it's not that surprising. If we live in a context where um, both scientists and the general public think that in the US at least, that English only is perfectly acceptable and, and perhaps uh, the ideal, um, it's not gonna be that surprising that you might be that critical of whether bilingualism uh, creates improvements uh, for uh, the mind and the brain. And um, I wanna ask today in what I'm going to talk about, why there's been this controversy and how we might begin to think about what are the right questions to ask? Um, and what we've come to see is that asking whether bilingualism simply benefits the mind and the brain and the individuals who are bilingual or multilingual may not be the right question. Um, we need to ask this question in a much more complex context and in a context where we ask how it is that using two languages comes to hold consequences for language and for cognition and for the brain over the lifespan. And we need to acknowledge that there may be variation across these different contexts. Uh, so I'm gonna focus today on two questions that I hope will begin to address some of these questions about the consequences of bilingual experience. I first wanna ask how we can develop a causal account, not a correlational account, but a causal account of how minds and brains may be changed by learning and using two languages. And I'm gonna argue that if you wanna understand the consequences of bilingualism, we need to look at language itself. And bilingualism is about language. Um, yet very curiously, much of the research on the consequences of bilingualism has compared groups that are monolingual, bilingual, and not looked very deeply at just what it means to use two languages or more. The second focus is on asking how we can place this research in a context that acknowledges the individual social and political realities that I've mentioned already. We need to understand who is bilingual, the idea that there are many different types of bilinguals, and how context for language learning and language use vary and how the very same individual who may be bilingual and may, who may have become bilingual in one context may actually be a different type of bilingual person in another context. So this may be a much more complex uh, dynamic than we've previously acknowledged. So very briefly, just to say who is bilingual. Um, I'm trained as a cognitive 
psychologists, cognitive scientists, uh, I am going to take a very broad view of who is bilingual and say that anyone who is actively using two or more languages, regardless of when they acquire the languages and regardless of how fully they speak the languages, um, that we are going to consider anyone who's actively using two languages to be included as bilingual. Understanding that um, there are striking and significant differences across people who differ in whether they acquired the languages early or late in the home in a tutored instruction context, whether they are immersed in their uh, L1 or immersed in their L2. So we're gonna be very broad and we're gonna try to be very clear in each of the studies about who it is we're actually studying. So the metaphor um, that has framed much of the research in the past two decades is this idea that the bilingual is a mental juggler. And I note at the outset that one of the few claims in this literature on bilingualism that I think is no longer refuted is the idea that both languages become active regardless of the requirement to use one language alone. That might have been a provocative and controversial claim 20 years ago. Uh, there are now hundreds of studies um, that look at the lexicon, look at grammar, look at phonology, look at different types of languages. And what we see is we see this parallel activation of the two languages. My little example here is a Dutch example. Um, I had the wonderful opportunity to live in the Netherlands twice in my life uh, and to have the experience of both doing research in the Netherlands and of uh, beginning to really understand how being in a context where people are multilingual may affect uh, their mind and brain. This is an example just of a Dutch speaker naming what is one of the most common objects in the Netherlands, a picture of bicycle. And the idea here is simply that if you are bilingual or multilingual, you have many ways that you can name the very same object. And that if you are bilingual or multilingual, not only do you need to select one language, but you need to navigate the potential competition across them. And sometimes the two languages are going to line up and converge and other times they're going to conflict. And so we need to understand the consequences that arise in each of these cases. So what are these consequences? Well, the initial story we told and, and I'm using we very generically, the sort of the royal we, um, the initial story was quite simple. The initial story was that bilinguals draw on domain general mechanisms of cognitive control to keep all these balls in the air and to learn how to navigate and negotiate and resolve the competition across their two languages. So in effect, bilinguals become expert mental jugglers and that expertise then draws on cognitive resources and spills over to other domains of life. It becomes a more general uh, cognitive juggling act rather than just a linguistic juggling act. Um, but how does this happen? And how does the variation across bilingual experience shape these consequences? And critically, as I noted earlier, the discussion about these consequences of bilingualism has largely reported uh, correlational data on the performance of different language groups on largely executive function tasks. It's not typically examined language processes directly, nor paid close attention to variation across bilinguals or the context of bilingual use. Um, and many past studies have documented these effects of the more dominant language spilling into the second language. And, and I just note that uh, I'm not gonna review the evidence here, but um, this evidence is really, really quite compelling. And, and we note that we see it for proficient speakers as well as learners, the way this competition and interaction across the two languages manifests itself may be different for emerging bilinguals and for proficient speakers. Um, but we see it in all cases. We see it when speakers uh, use languages that are similar to one another structurally and when they use languages that are different from one another uh, structurally like uh, Chinese and English or languages that are not alphabetic, or languages like American Sign Language and English, a signed language and a spoken language. So we see these dynamics in all cases. Um, and again, I'm not saying that those dynamics are identical for all language pairings, but that they exist and that we see this openness in the bilingual system. 
We also, as I mentioned earlier, see it for the lexicon, the phonology and the grammar. And again, I'm not gonna have time today to review that evidence, but I'm happy to talk about any of it later. In our research that I'm gonna present, what we do is we turn the tables. We ask this question, are bilinguals really monolingual-like in their L1? Or is it that all of this juggling and interaction comes to affect the L1? So can we ask the story now about the native language? What is the role of the native language in learning a second language and becoming bilingual? And I'm gonna argue that the regulation of the native or dominant language may be critical to achieve bilingual proficiency and for new adult L2 learning. And in fact, that it may underlie some of these consequences of bilingualism and may provide at least in a very initial and modest way, uh, a uh, causal story to try to begin to identify the mechanisms that change language and by doing so, that change cognition and the brain. And the claims I'm going to make are that the native language itself changes to enable fluent L2 use. The native language is not stable. Successful, successful adult L2 learners may be individuals who in fact are able to learn to regulate the native language. There may be something slightly upsetting about the idea about being in a context where you're learning an L2 and your L1 is changing, um, but learning to negotiate the cross-language competition that characterizes proficient bilingualism may be crucial. And in, in a, again, a sort of non-technical term that I'm gonna use here, I'm gonna say that the L1 the native language may take a hit. And uh, as I, when I talk about this, I always say the hit sounds terrible. It doesn't, hit is, is painful. Um, and, and the idea here is that there may be processing costs that initially slow the native language, make native language processing more error prone, make learners initially less sensitive to some L1 features. But we think that all of that hit, all of that pain may be because there is going to be tremendous gain. And what is the gain? The gain is that, or the hypothesized gain, is that the L1 is going to become open to the influences of the L2 and essentially create a context where the L2 can be admitted into this language system. And we hypothesize that acquiring these regulation skills in the native language maybe at least partly responsible for some of these cognitive consequences associated with bilingualism. So where did this idea come from? Well, in 2002, which is almost 20 years ago, we did a little experiment in the lab because we were just interested in how people translated words and uh, named words, how they use their two languages as they were beginning to learn the second language. Um, and at the time we were studying native English speakers who were learning either French or Spanish. And um, we just, we, we performed these very simple tasks, present a word on the computer screen, name it aloud as quickly as you can, present a word on the computer screen, just translate it into the other language as quickly as you can. And we found something very curious. We found that when learners just name words in English, their L1, they were slower to do that than individuals who were actually proficient in the L2, even though everyone in the study was an L1 speaker of English. So what you see in this graph is that the L2 is slower. These are reaction times for word naming. They're slower to name L2 than an L1. That's Nothing, nothing particularly exciting. Um, and what you see is the purple bar is higher than the black bar on the right because these are less proficient learners relative to more proficient learners. But look at the data on the left. What you see is these less proficient learners in the L2 were slower in the L1. Why? Well, it could be many different things. Um, and we, in this particular paper that was published in 2002, we ruled out the idea that there are 
at least on this one dimension for working memory ability, that the uh, learners who were less proficient were uh, somehow less likely to go on and become, uh, you know, become more skilled. Um, so we think it's not working. We see this for both high and low working memory learners. Um, there's something about using the native language that has become slow. And that, that was a little tip off that there was something going on here. If we fast forward to a more recent study in 2015, this is a study that was conducted with my graduate student Kinsey, then Kinsey Bice at Penn State. Um, we asked the question of just how quickly does this all come online? How quickly might your native language be influenced by your second language? And this was a study with uh, native English speakers who were either monolingual or enrolled in a Spanish class at Penn State. And I'm gonna say a lot about State College Pennsylvania for, and I apologize to anyone who, uh, you know, who, who wants to defend the honor of Pennsylvania, but Pennsylvania is one of those blue places on the map. Pennsylvania is a very monolingual English environment. And in Pennsylvania, um, individuals who are taking a university class in a second language like Spanish um, are primarily doing that in the context where they're in a very English context while they're doing it. Um, typically, it's difficult for students at this level to become highly proficient from taking classes, especially in the first semesters of taking classes. And so what we did is we looked at monolingual speakers of English who are not studying Spanish. We looked at learners in the very first term they were studying Spanish, and we looked at individuals who were slightly more advanced and more intermediate in Spanish, but they were not proficient Spanish speakers. And what we did is we performed a very simple psycholinguistic task, lexical decision in English as a lexical task. We show you a word, and this is in English, they're L1. We show you a word and we say, is this word a real word in English, a string of letters. And if you see tomato, you'd press the yes button. Book, you'd press the yes button. If I show you a non-word, you'd press the no button. And the twist in this experiment is that some of the words were cognates with Spanish. So the ideas of tomato and tomate um, are cognate pairs, whereas book and libro are very different from one another. The question was, would the Spanish influence the English among these native English speakers who were completely dominant in English. They were just learning uh, Spanish. Okay, you look at the behavioral data and you say, hmm, nothing. The, the, at behaviorally, the learners look just like the monolinguals. But then what we did is we did collected EEG data and we looked at their brains. And what we see here, it's not forwarding. What we see here, are data from uh, CZ, so I'm not gonna go into all the gory details of the uh, EG, but you have an ERP study where you have the CZ is right in the middle of your head. And what we're looking at, the red and the black in these uh, three columns are the difference between the cognates and the non-cognates. And what you can see is you can see that the monolinguals are not sensitive and they shouldn't be sensitive uh, to the relationship between Spanish and English. What you see is there is a cognate effect in the brain that's beginning to emerge. And by the time a person is intermediate, which is again, not particularly proficient, the native language has come to affect the second language. I'm sorry, it's coming to be affected by the second language. It's early in the morning here in California. Um, so what we see is native language change almost right away in the beginning of learning a second language. Their brains are showing this activity. Their behavior is not, but their brains are sensitive to, in English, to the Spanish. And so the idea that we began to think about is that becoming bilingual may not only be about acquiring and using the L2, but also about the way that the L1 changes. And showing the sensitivity uh, in L1 to the L2 is a first step. It's not an indication of regulation, not the person isn't necessarily doing anything actively, uh, but it shows that there's sensitivity. So the question is, can we show that the L1 is used differently in response to the L2? And there are two contexts in which we have, we and others have demonstrated that the native language may take a hit. 
One occurs when learners are immersed in an L2 environment during study abroad or travel. Um, and the second is when we bring this into the laboratory and we ask uh, proficient bilinguals to speak each of their languages uh, after they've spoken the other language. And I just note that I'm going to uh, mention, and again, not go into any detail today on this, but happy to talk about it later, that in the literature on memory and learning, uh, there is a very rich history of research on something called desirable difficulties. And what that means is that in learning, individuals learn better when their initial learning, their initial encoding is in a context where they're able to learn from errors they make, where they may take longer because they're elaborating the meaning of things. There may be a hit early on that translates to a benefit later on. And it's interesting to think about the relationship of this research on language to the research in the memory literature. So L1 not only changes, but takes a hit when learners are immersed abroad. Uh, this is a study that was done and uh, published in 2009. Uh, Jared Link was then a graduate student at Penn State uh, who traveled to Salamanca, Spain uh, and asked uh, L1 English speakers who were on study abroad in Salamanca to perform a set of tasks in English and in Spanish. Um, the immersed learners were in Spain and Salamanca, and then he compared their behavior to classroom learners who were in very monolingual Pennsylvania. And the main result in this study was that the L1 appeared to be suppressed when learners were immersed in an L2 environment. And one, uh, one task that we used, there were many, but this, this is uh, just an illustration of what happened in the study. Um, this was a semantic verbal fluency task where individuals are asked, produce as many words in a given category as you can in 30 seconds. So I might say fruit and you would say, you know, apple, pear, banana, blah, blah, blah. In English, I can ask you to do the same thing in your other language. And that's what we did here. And you can see that, <clears throat> The production in Spanish is lowered. What you have on the y-axis are number of uh, category exemplars, number of uh, individual exemplars that are produced in response to this uh, category. And uh, that's not a surprise. These are all dominant uh, English speakers who are at uh, the early stages of learning Spanish. But the critical result is on the left. And what you see in these data, you see the black bar is less than the unfilled bar. The black bar are the immersed learners. Those who were immersed in Spain produced less in English, which was their dominant or native language, making it appear that their English had taken a hit. And in fact, one of the things that's interesting is that we often don't wanna trust phenomenology, but people have quite rich phenomenology about how it feels like they lose access to their native language when they're in an immersed context in another language. So other uh, evidence comes from the laboratory where we can take this kind of phenomenon and we can basically demonstrate something very simple and uh, similar. Um, so in, there now have been many, many experiments that have been performed uh, and reported on language switching and language mixing. Uh, essentially, you produce either in your L1 or your L2 in response to a cue. The data on the left are from a very, very well-known study by Moiter and Allport in 1999, um, looking at language switching. Um, the data on the right are from the study that we did in the Netherlands in 2000 with Dutch English bilinguals. And the basic story here is the same in all cases. What you see is that there's a cost to mixing or switching languages, but that cost is greater for the L1 than for the L2. The hypothesis is that the L1 has to be inhibited to be able to speak the weaker L2. Speech planning for the weaker language requires some control of the stronger language and that these costs that we see are hypothesized to reflect uh, that process. Um, we can illustrate that um, using both behavior and using other uh, methods. This is a study that used uh, EEG. Uh, I'll note that we've also done this using um, 
using uh, acoustic measures of spoken uh, speech. Um, what we have here is a study where we did switching in by blocks. So these are were a group of Mandarin English speakers. They either spoke their L1 in response to a set of pictures. They named a set of pictures in their L1, which was Mandarin, or they named the pictures in L2, which was English. And the only, uh, the only manipulation in the experiment was whether they did L1 first and then L2, or L2 first and then L1. We varied the order of speaking. And what you can see in the slide is you can see that the pictures are the same pictures. We just, they named them in each language, but the same pictures. And so what would you predict? You predict that if I repeat the same thing twice, well, you should, you should observe repetition priming. You should be facilitated by virtue of that repetition. Um, and so the question we ask is, would we see that kind of facilitation uh, in, in the evidence for naming in L2 and for the evidence for naming in L1? And this is, again, just a little snippet of uh, ERP data looking at uh, CZ, again, the same uh, electrode. And um, here's the critical result. If you look on the right at L2 and you look at the difference between the red and the blue, the red is when you name the L2 benefiting from repetition. You've already named these pictures in L1. And what you see is reduced negativity. Repetition helps you when you're speaking the L2. If you look at the data on the left for L1, you see the opposite. What you see is that the red is now higher than the blue. What you see is increased negativity. And remember, these are the same pictures that are being presented. So they've seen these before. And so what we show is an inhibitory pattern for L1 and a facilitatory pattern for L2. Um, we ask the question, is it a matter of just if you're you're showing this inhibition when you speak your L1 after speaking your L2. Well, what if you get to speak your L1 for a while? Do you recover? And in the context of this experiment, people did not recover. Um, they presumably eventually recover in real life, but this, this uh, inhibition is quite persistent. We've done this with uh, fMRI and find exactly the same kind of thing. We find it's the L1 that's really affected when you have these switches between languages. So, uh, and a number of people, uh, Tamar Dagani uh, in Haifa has done these experiments showing that you can even have a brief exposure to the L2 and you can alter the uh, production in L1. Um, a great deal of research has shown this isn't just about lexical processing and lexical production. Uh, research by Julie Ducius on the effects of L2 and L1 on the grammar and by Charles Chang on the phonetics show that there are persistent effects of the second language on the native language. Is it attrition? Some people have said, oh, this looks a lot like attrition. You're losing something. Um, and we and others uh, have argued that, no, this is not attrition. These are the ordinary dynamics of being bilingual. The two languages are active and the directionality of, of that activity is such that we see bidirectional interactions and dynamics. It's not just from the L1 to the L2, it's in both directions. Where else do we see this inhibition of the L1 or absence of it? Well, I just mentioned this, this is speculation on my part, but there are fascinating data showing that uh, we know that, and, and all of you heard Ellen Bialystok's talk in this series, um, we are, you know, one of the most provocative claims about the consequences of bilingualism is that it appears to uh, provide a set of protections against the symptoms of dementia. And what we know is that bilinguals with dementia are diagnosed about four to five years later than monolinguals. But what if we ask about their language? And there's some, you know, there, there's a little bit of data on this and not enough to come to firm conclusions, but there's a sense in some of the data that bilinguals at the point where they are actually diagnosed as being demented, lose their L2 they cannot speak the L2. Well, some people think that might be because it's a semantic deficit for the L2. We speculate that this may be another illustration that L2 fluency is achieved at a cost to the L1. If you're at a point where you are demented and no longer can inhibit your L1, no longer can regulate your native language, you may not be able to speak the second language. And this is a hypothesis that requires 
much additional uh, empirical investigation. So the claim that I'm making is that the native language is not the rock of Gibraltar, the L2 has persistent effects on the L1 uh, for learners and for highly proficient bilinguals. Uh, these cross-language interactions, these dynamics come to change the native language as well as the second language. And we know from the neuroimaging literature from the MRI studies that they come to sit largely in the same place in the brain. Um, so one of the implications, and we can return to this in discussion, but one of the implications is that this monolingual native speaker model that we began with when we looked at these constraints on L2 learning may not be the goal of adult L2 learning. An L2 learner needs to become a bilingual speaker of the L1, not a monolingual-like speaker of the L1. And we need to ask, what does it mean to be a native speaker? Now, as I've said, this hit is not a bad thing. The hit is um, a part of the process of acquiring and becoming skilled in a second language, becoming bilingual. Uh, and the, uh, right, that the hit has been misinterpreted as being deficit in some studies, people say, see, bilinguals are slower, learners are slower, and that means it's a bad thing, it's dangerous to learn a second language. And what we know is that this is very, very far from being a deficit. Um, we also know uh, that proficient bilinguals very rarely make the mistake of speaking the unintended language. So the question then is if both languages are active and we have the dynamics that I've, I've suggested, um, how do bilinguals control what they say? And the claim we're making is they regulate the activation of the native language and that regulation draws on mechanisms of cognitive control. But we need to ask this question in a context that goes outside just looking at very simple lexical phenomena in the laboratory. What happens when bilinguals interact with one another? Well, we can ask, and I want to, want to in this very final part of my talk, try to uh, very briefly identify a set of contexts, it's not going to be an exhaustive list, of the context that in which languages are used that might affect regulation and coordination of these cognitive resources. One of them is code switching. Bilinguals often switch with one another in the middle of a sentence. Um, the code switching is being extensively uh, investigated by uh, many different laboratories and at many different levels of, of uh, processing. Um, a second, uh, a second, factor that's very important are what I'm going to call social networks and language decision making. We don't live alone in the laboratory, although during the pandemic it may feel like we're living alone um, at our desks. Um, but the truth is that in, in uh, real life, pre and hopefully post pandemic life, uh, we live and work in social networks and we are continually making decisions about with whom can I speak which language, who is bilingual and whether people speak the same languages that you do, we're to think about that. We've mentioned immersion and we've mentioned the idea that, um, you know, that, that there may be changes in the uh, immersed environment. Um, but we also need to think about linguistic diversity. In that blue map, if I just go back to that one more time, that that blue map, well, there are parts of the United States that are very linguistically diverse, including where I live now in Southern California. Um, and so it may be that we are influenced by the diversity of the environments we live in, about how many languages and how many different types of speakers we are surrounded by. So I wanna very, very briefly just consider how this may really shape the kinds of cognitive and neural processes that I've been talking about. So how does code switching affect coordination between bilinguals? In the psycholinguistic literature, there's a lot of discussion about models of alignment, the idea that when we look at actual discourse, what we see is that people align to one another. Uh, they entrain to one another, that you begin to use the same words and structures uh, as their interlocutors. Um, and what we see in code switching is that bilingual speakers and listeners begin to tune to one another in a way that enables the prediction of code switch speech. This is a study that was done with um, my 
former postdoc uh, Melinda Fricke uh, and colleague Julie Jusius. Um, and what we did here is to look at, we did a corpus study looking at code switch speech in uh, Spanish English bilinguals, and then did an eye tracking study using visual world paradigm to ask to what extent are bilinguals sensitive to subtle cues in the speech of their interlocutors to pick up on that cue to think that, oh, even if this is not a consciously that they're even if they're not consciously aware of this cue, that something's happening that might predict that a code switch is about to come. And what this study showed is that for Spanish English bilingual speech rate slows down prior to a code switch. English becomes more Spanish like, and then we look at their performance in visual world and we show that bilingual listeners use this subtle phonetic information to predict an upcoming switch. So the idea, my little tango joke here, um, is the idea that, you know, bilinguals become really be come to do a linguistic tango with one another. They are aligned with one another in trying to listen to what's going on and who they're speaking with. And we think that this alignment may be an index of bilingual language regulation. There's a fantastic study from Edith Kahn and colleagues at University of Florida showing that code switching and looking at ERP behavior during code switching depends on whether you are in the company of other bilinguals or not. Your brain is sensitive to the company you keep. And so all of this suggests that this is a very social phenomenon. This is something that also is going to give rise to cognitive changes that may not only affect you know, the way we typically think about executive function, but also how we think about prediction mechanisms, which are crucially uh, important. However, we know that not all bilinguals code switch. Uh, some bilinguals are also dominant in their native language. Others become dominant in a second or other language. Some live in a context where everyone is similarly bilingual. And the context itself may begin to determine the way that uh, bilinguals recruit cognitive resources. And as Luck and Bialystok have noted, bilingualism is not a categorical variable. We have many, many different types of bilinguals in many different types of environments. And so I want to tell you very briefly about a study that uh, Annie Beatty Martinez was the lead author on. Uh, and uh, this is a study that attempts to illustrate the importance of interactional context in um, bilingual uh, language processing. And this is a study that looked at Spanish English speakers. They were in three different locations. They were all highly proficient Spanish English speakers. And the criterion in this study was that you could name a picture in English or Spanish at a proficiency level, at an accuracy level higher than 90%. There are obviously many, many other other ways of, of measuring proficiency here. But the point is that these are all bilinguals who we would consider highly proficient in Spanish and English. One group lived in Granada, Spain. In Granada, Spain, they use the two languages separately. So they use the two languages a lot, but they typically have Spanish is the home language, the community language, uh, the social language. English is the work or school language. They do not code switch very much, um, but they have this separated context. In contrast, in San Juan, Puerto Rico, you see what we called an integrated context. So in San Juan, Puerto Rico, either language can be used opportunistically. There's a lot of code switching and Spanish and English can be used at home, at work, in, at school, uh, in different contexts. Uh, and the third context, um, coming back to, it does feel like I'm sort of picking on state college, which I am, um, but uh, we call the very context. And the idea here, is that State College Pennsylvania, as I've said about three times already, is a very highly monolingual English environment. However, there are many international students who come to study at Penn State. And so those students are immersed in English as the L2. Many of them have code switching experience between Spanish and English. But here's what's crucial. They cannot necessarily speak Spanish with everyone or even many people on campus. You walk across campus, you hear English. So they're constantly having to make a decision about with whom they can speak 
which language. And what we did in the study is we used uh, an executive function task, the AXCPT, the AX continuous performance task, as a way of identifying individual differences in proactive and reactive cognitive control. And the idea is that these are mechanisms that may reflect coordination and regulation um, of cognitive control during language processing. And we asked a very simple question. If I give people in these different environments a very simple picture naming task in English and Spanish, and also give them this AXCPT task, will their performance on this cognitive control task tell us something about their picture naming performance? Is there a relationship between their cognitive performance and their language performance in these three distinct interactional contexts. And I, I don't have time today to go into all of the data, but the answer is yes. And the most exciting result was in State College, Pennsylvania. So what we found is that in this very context, AY error on the x-axis is just a measure of degree of proactive control. The result was greater proactive control reliance was associated with higher picture naming accuracy in Spanish, the L1. These are Spanish English bilinguals in this very English dominant environment. If they have proactive control, they don't lose their Spanish. They can maintain their Spanish. The results support the claim of uh, the adaptive control hypothesis that Green and Albert Taleve proposed in 2013 that the language use is determined in part by the demands that are placed on the speaker by the environment. Um, what we found is that in the separate environment in Granada, we see a pattern that's much more reactive. Um, we see much less uh, influence directly on language processing um, by these uh, individuals who are in an environment where if you're in Granada, you use the language separately, you don't code switch, but you're not making too many decisions because you know when you should use each language, the cues are present. When you're in Puerto Rico, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to make that many decisions because everyone is, or pretty much everyone is Spanish English bilingual and is able to code switch and uh, using the two languages uh, uh, cooperatively. So the point is that cognitive resources are used differently to perform language tasks as a function of the context in which they're used. And we see, and I'm not gonna go into detail here, but we see a convergence with this conclusion across many different recent studies, work of, uh, uh, Jason Gulliver and Deborah Titone uh, at McGill University have used language entropy measures as a way of examining the social context of language use and showing that um, there is, uh, again, there, the importance of who you talk to and how many different people you talk to to use each of your languages is what seems to be tuning this proactive control. Uh, we see evidence uh, here that high entropy individuals, people who are talking to many different people in a, in a dense uh, social network have greater connectivity uh, between the ACC and the Putamen, uh, and also associated with a greater proactive uh, control. Um, we see recent work that suggests that social learning strengthens new language learning in adults. All of this suggests that having the social network and, and thinking about how that is going to create demands on the cognitive system is going to be crucial. What happens during language immersion? Well, a recent study that uh, Haiyan Zhang and our group uh, first author on showed that if you look at a group of uh, Mandarin English bilinguals who are living either in Beijing, China in their L1 environment or in our favorite place, State College, Pennsylvania, in a in an uh, L2 environment that um, the L2 immersed bilinguals are showing uh, really uh, uh, magnificent proactive control. And that is coupled with a very, very clear inhibition and the ability to inhibit their L1 when they need to. Okay. Final, final, and I will I will wrap up because I know we've we've gone on. I have gone on here, um, and just finish up. 
So in 2016, I had the opportunity to move from uh, State College to California. Uh, and uh, there are many reasons for this move. Um, but one of the things that was very exciting for me is that we were suddenly living in this uh, very bilingual place. As someone who's worked on bilingualism for a long time and spent most of my life living in this monolingual context, it was very exciting to think about what kind of research we might do in this linguistically diverse environment. One of my graduate students, Kinsey Bice, who I've mentioned before, um, was with me in Pennsylvania at the point where I decided to move. And uh, it's not the best situation when a graduate student's face with their advisor moving, but Kinsey was very good sport about this and said, I'm coming with you. And she ended up doing half of her dissertation in Pennsylvania and half of her dissertation in California. And the, oops, let me get to the right place here. Okay, um, and what she did, she did a learning study where she was interested in whether bilinguals were better language learners and monolinguals. Uh, she was frustrated about the fact that many of the previous studies have really used fairly simple tasks like paired associate learning. She said, we're gonna do something really hard. We're gonna teach these um, bilinguals in English and Spanish and monolingual English speakers. We're gonna teach them Finnish vowel harmony, not something they have ever ever come across either in their native language or in their second language experience. And here's the short version of this. The short version of this, everybody learns. But when we look at monolinguals, these are people who are all identified both in Pennsylvania and California as being speakers of English only. Everybody learns the, the vowel harmony rule, but only the monolinguals in California are able to generalize the rule where we see evidence for this in the ERP record. So this was a serendipitous result. We wanna be very cautious about how far we go in uh, drawing conclusions, but the very exciting possibility is that monolingual brains in linguistically diverse places may benefit, may be more bilingual-like because that diversity of language experience may again tune the brain to be more open to speech in ways that we don't see in monolingual environments like central Pennsylvania. And obviously a great deal of research is gonna to have to be launched now to ask this question and hopefully we'll be able to do this post pandemic. So how does this all address the controversies about bilingualism? Uh, the claim that I'm making is that this regulation of the native language may contribute to a causal account of how these consequences of bilingualism arise. We need to understand how they are uh, quite different in different interactional contexts and how we may even see them for monolingual speakers who find themselves in contexts of very in linguistic and cultural diversity. And our goal now is to really try to capture this social and linguistic diversity to develop models that account adequately for these dynamic changes in different contexts. The findings I've reported point to a set of possible mechanisms. This is the beginning of a research program, um, really not the end. Uh, we have uh, said already that there are many different types of bilinguals. And so there's a very, very big research agenda that we need to address. So I'm just gonna come back for one second to the map and just say again, where are the bilinguals in the US? Bilinguals are in these places like California, like the rim of the country. And who are the bilinguals? The bilinguals in the US, the primary bilinguals in the US are heritage speakers of a home language. Um, they are the majority bilinguals in the US. But I note for all of us who are doing research on bilingualism, they are the least studied group of bilinguals in the US. Um, and this is something that really has to change going forward. Um, and I just end by saying we need to be modest because there's a great deal we don't know. Uh, and we, uh, we really don't know how the plasticity of early childhood then is maintained uh, later in adulthood. We see a lot of evidence for neuroplasticity, um, but we don't have a very good story about uh, what endures and, and what is ephemeral. Um, we don't have a very good story about how uh, the particular languages themselves may modulate these, these changes. And um, 
on the science of this, um, I just want to end by saying we would know none of this if we studied monolingual only. Um, these implications are interesting and they pique our curiosity, but they really do truly require a revision of our traditional stories about language development, about cognitive control, and about the plasticity associated with language experience. And I am going to stop there. Thank you.